So good morning. Today is the 26th day of Tishrei, the 11th of November of October. We're up to the fourth reading of the first part of the Torah, Bereshit. And we have the very well-known story of the tree of knowledge and the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And this is certainly, you know what, maybe the most well-known story in the entire Bible. And we want to shed new light on it. That's what we're going to, go, going to do today. So let me just, I'm going to read it to you. And, um, and uh, well, not the verses themselves, just the what we wrote about it in Wonders. So in Hasidic thought, the tree of knowledge corresponds to the spiritual service known as clarifications. And what is clarifications? To clarify in Hebrew, levarer, avodat berurim, is to elevate the sparks of holiness and discard the husks of impurity from reality and return them to their source. That's what the tree of knowledge represents. So it's a it's a clarifying process by sifting through reality. And we are drawn to certain things in the world, and those things that we are drawn to, we have a portion in, and it's up to us to use these things the right way. When we use them the right way, we've clarified them. We've elevated the holiness that's trapped inside, and we've discarded the impurity that is surrounding it, like a, like a shell. The tree of life, on the other hand, corresponds to the service known as unifications. What is unification about? Unification is what we call cleaving to God, by which we discover the divine essence within reality. We're not looking to elevate a spark. A spark is not the divine essence. It's just like a, a glimmer of holiness. The divine essence is much, much more than that. It's saying that reality um, in its uh, fullness is actually divine, except that we experience it in very uh, undivine or, or the opposite types of ways because there is uh, what we would call a state of um, being separate that reality seems to us to be separate because we're separate. So we don't see it for what it really is. We can't see it the way it is. Now, with that, armed with that understanding, so when you normally read this description of the Garden of Eden, you come to the conclusion that both the tree of life and the tree of knowledge were in the garden. Right? That's the usual reading. People think that both trees were in the Garden of Eden. But there is an important uh, uh, principle in Talmudic analysis that's called, from a definitive positive statement, you can infer a negative statement. What does that mean? It means that if you tell me something is true, then I can also infer that the opposite is false or that something else is false. Um, it's not exactly logical. It's not logic in the usual sense. If I tell you, a is true, so obviously a uh, uh, not A is, is not true. That, that's obvious. We're not saying that. We're saying if I tell you there's A and B, and A is, let's say, a person. There's uh, Jack and, uh, I don't know, a Chet. And Jack is a dog. It doesn't mean that Chet is a dog. It could be that, in fact, if I tell you specifically, Jack is a dog, you can infer that Chet is not a dog. He's something else. Okay, this is a very important principle. Miklal hen atalamed lav. That's what it's called in the Talmud. So now, what does it say? It says, from the ground, God made to grow every tree that was pleasing to the sight and good for food with the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of knowledge. So what did I do here? I told you you made all the trees. Then I'm telling you about one specific tree. The tree of life is in the garden. And then there's one more called, and the tree of knowledge. And from that, you can infer that it was only the tree of life that was in the garden and not the tree of knowledge. What does this mean? It means that when you have divine consciousness, that means living in the garden of Eden. Tree of life, like we said, is divine consciousness. It's what we call the, the work of unification. It's seeing divinity in everything. It's seeing the divine in everything. But 
the tree of knowledge is not in the Garden of Eden. It's already outside. And this makes a lot of sense. Why does it make so much sense? Because um, by eating from the tree of knowledge, Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. It, we, I know it says, and then God cast them out. But that's like God signing the, signing the warrant, as it were. They had already been outside because they wanted to eat from the tree of knowledge, and that tree was outside. Now, again, this is you can also understand a little bit metaphorically that when we say inside and outside the garden, we don't necessarily mean a physical space, although that could be true as well. We primarily are focusing on the state of mind, the state of mind that is called being in the Garden of Eden translates into what we call the service of unification, of being one with God, and then seeing that everything is godly. But the moment that you're pursuing knowledge of good and evil, a moral stance, and so on, then you're automatically finding yourself outside the state of mind called the Garden of Eden. Again, it doesn't mean that it's not necessary. It just means that it's not the Garden of Eden. It's something else. Something else entirely. So what do we say about this? So by eating from the tree of knowledge, Adam was sent to work the earth from whence he had been taken, meaning formed. And there's an amazing gematria here, an amazing numerical equivalence, because the words, which in Hebrew are together, from where he had been taken, asher lukach, is equal exactly to tree of knowledge meaning he was sent out to where he was taken from. He was taken from where he was taken from, that's equal to the tree of knowledge. He was sent out, that is where the tree of knowledge is. Beautiful gematria. What this means is that the service of clarifications is not to be found in the Garden of Eden. The moment you, that you uh, exit the state of mind called the Garden of Eden, then you are forced to engage in what we call clarification of pitting good against evil. And again, pitting good and against evil doesn't necessarily mean a war that's in being engaged outside of yourself. It could be something in your own consciousness. So you have a consciousness where I'm one with God, and you have a consciousness where the goal of that consciousness is my growth in my understanding of good and evil. It's like that everybody in the world now is engaged in this long lesson of figuring out what the difference between good and the evil is. It's a very, very difficult lesson to learn. It's like all of humanity that's not living anymore in the Garden of Eden is in a state of each one in their own particular uh, area of life is figuring out the difference between good and evil. That's what we're doing. That's the work that we were sent to do outside the garden. One person could be understanding good and evil in morality. The other one can be understanding it in construction. What's a good way to, 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 to work and what's not a good way to work? How, how do you, how do you um, act uh, uh, correctly with your workers, with, uh, with your suppliers? Um, that's good and evil also. That's like business conduct. A any area of life that you're in, with your children, you learn good and evil. You learn about how to how to act, how to parent, how to be a good parent. All these things are lessons in good and evil, and they're all done outside of the tree of uh, outside of the Garden of Eden. So, to rectify reality using this method of elevating the sparks of holiness, one must exhibit self-sacrifice, and be willing to go out of the Garden of Eden. It's the easiest thing in the world, actually to just go into a state of bliss where everything is gone. And then you don't have to step out of the Garden of Eden. You're fine. There are people like that in the world. They don't want to go do their duty. They want to stay where everything is Everything is easy. Everything is clearly divine. The, you know, it's all good. There's nothing to look at. But there's no clarification going on. You're not fixing the world. You're not changing anything. So the service of clarifications demands a self-sacrifice needed in knowing that you are dust 
and to dust you shall return. That is being this in the state outside of the Garden of Eden. That you know that there is a limit to life. You're made out of dust, you go back to dust. Like one of the classes I want to talk about in, in uh, Los Angeles, hopefully in two weeks, is exactly about this verse. And what is human life when you look at this verse? What, what, how, do, how should we define our lives? What do we need to see ourselves as? So I called it the, something like the flowering of human life. It, it, because flowers are short-lived. They're very beautiful, but they're short-lived. And, they're, uh, and, and they do something spectacular because they give meaning. They, they do something that almost not very, very similar to the fact uh, that a human being can give meaning to life. It's, an, it's a beautiful thing that, you know, when you're able to do that. So following this idea, we discover that Eve's mistake was in assuming that the tree of knowledge could also be found inside the Garden of Eden alongside the tree of life. That's what, That was her mistake, that she wanted to eat and remain inside the, the, the Garden of Eden. But that doesn't work. The moment you eat from this tree, you're automatically outside already. And again, it's self-sacrifice. You did it with self-sacrifice. It wasn't something that she did for uh, her craving to satisfy her need. She did it like someone volunteering to do something. But there's another point that we learn from this analysis, and that is that the main function of the tree of knowledge, the main use for which we need to put our faculty of knowledge is to rectify and clarify our portion in the world. So whenever we're dealing with the world and we're talking about something that is a question of good and evil, so then in those cases we're clarifying our portion in the world. Now, now we're really doing what we were meant to do. That's our real mission. The deep psychological translation of this point is that we should use our knowledge, our faculty of differentiating between good and evil by figuring out to whom to attribute the good and to whom to attribute the evil. And here we're certainly talking about something so relevant because it's unbelievable that there are so many people in the world that cannot tell the difference. They simply cannot. It means that they don't have a portion in this world. If you don't have a portion in this world, you certainly don't have a portion in the world to come. And that, you have to know this. I, I received, a, we only have a, a minute le like left, but I received a very interesting video yesterday from a, a group of thinkers in the United States. And their words of, of, of strength for, for, for the Jewish people was that you should know that because you're able to maintain a high level of both fertility and involvement in the world at the same time, think about it, all the very advanced cultures, the Western world is under the number needed, the, the percentage needed to even continue to, 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 to retain their numbers. So they said something that was amazing to me. I, I didn't think about this. Stop worrying about all the naysayers because the ones that count in the sense they were thinking about like technology or 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 you know involvement in, in the in what what is building the world, if you want to, I mean, I think there are other areas, it's not just technology, but they're underpopulated. They're making themselves disappear and be completely irrelevant. And so they had this thing, you, you know, that the fertility number, uh, fertility per, uh, number, the number of women, number of children every every uh, woman has in Israel is, is close to four or over four. I don't, I don't remember what it is, the average number. There's nothing like that even close to that in the Western world. The only place that something like that exists is in, you know, the the third world, and they're they're not contributing almost anything. They're only 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 uh, 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 consumers. They, they they don't contribute. So this is amazing thing. So here's another aspect of this: that if you're not contributing to the d separation between good and evil in your life, then you're missing something. <laughs> you don't have a world. You 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 have no. You're you're not fertile. There's nothing to carry over to the next generation. These are the most important discussions. Like what makes something 
good? What makes something evil? Evil is not always necessarily evil in the sense of, um, um, you know, like an atrocity. Evil can be just something that is negative. It's something that's not productive. It's something that is the opposite of useful and so on. So, and we always talk about this idea that psychologically, the most important thing that Hasidus offers is to differentiate between the source of good and the source of evil. That I have to see always that whatever is wrong in my life is a consequence of my actions, my decisions, and whatever is good in my life is a gift from God. And even though this is counterintuitive, and we've spoken about this in the past, this is one of the great ideas. So we'll leave it with this, because we've gone over already. And uh, hope to see you tomorrow. All the best. Thank you, Rabbi.